Oh, uh, I was at the same table. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was on the same table. <laughs> Which game was it? We didn't, we built like a new one. It's just like a, we basically put together. I think the audience is reacting. So uh, what I was uh, looking to do today was I was just going to do a quick recap of the product and then really just spend as much time as I can on q and I figure everybody's got their own slice of how they've set up the product and configured it. And I'm sure you guys are seeing things like uh, your burn downs and some of them are probably reacting appropriately, which would look something similar to this. Some of them are probably not looking like that. And you're not getting covered and you're not actually seeing velocity or any of the data that you guys were hoping to kind of extrapolate. And that's nothing more than. Uh, just making sure we've got a couple things set up right and making sure that, uh, that there's certain date ranges, there's certain estimates, and we're getting um, a little bit of time commitment into the system, just letting us know uh, as you're working on different, um, whether it be a defect, whether it's a feature or, or user story, um, you know, it just needs a little bit of commitment of time as to the effort that you guys have put forth, and we'll work through that, as well as any you know, custom questions you guys have on kind of making the product a sure. benefit. Um, at its core, the system, uh, and again, this may be familiar for some of you, some of you this may be the first time, um, the product is essentially, uh, when it's initially set up, it's, it's built out to manage a multitude of different item types. Um, you've got the development side of the house, which is going to manage your defect in user story tracking, feature tracking, depends if you're an agile shopper or if you're not. Um, but we, uh, we work with a lot of game development companies, and so we've seen their spin on how to use the tool. And so it definitely plays well within that environment. So hopefully it should work really well for you guys. <clears throat> um, but everything starts with your project structure, which again, a lot of you probably already have project set up and the release structure. The project structure is going to be the starting point, which is going to be the foundation for everything you're building out. So this may be the game title and then some of the different breakdown of the areas of focus of the game. When you think about the release structure, this is when we're going to focus on time-based effort. What are we going to be working on now in the next week, two weeks? In this case, it sounds like we're doing five-week sprints. So that's going to be a focus. Sprint one, which again, very general terminology. You guys might actually use some type of number convention, or you might even just use the week as the name of this. However you want to approach it, but something that clearly identifies what it is you're working on. Product dash time frame dash whatever might be a potential scenario of a you know, naming convention you might use. But this is going to encapsulate all of the effort necessary, which as you see here, I've got bugs, I've got effects, I've got tasks. Everything that's a part of this sprint, a sprint one, is all completed. As you can tell over here, we've knocked it out. It's done. And we should have a completion date, which we were able to you know, hit it on time. Um, sprint three, we're just getting started on. I haven't actually done anything with this yet, so we're just kind of waiting to plan that sprint out. Um, as it comes to the data itself, the item types. Now, these are totally customizable by you guys. So if you don't want to call it a defect, you want to call it a bug, you want to call it you know, anything of that nature, you have the capacity to go and make those changes. I'm not going to go into great depth on the, the little nuances of the product line. Um, I'm happy to you know, kind of one off answer those questions. Um, I really want to focus on kind of getting into the things that you guys are working on and how that might help. Um, you have two ways in which you can view the data, both in a Kanban or grid view. Um, yeah, but, uh, there we go. So the advantage of doing the grid view is that you're able to see a lot more data. And so if you want to see a concentration of a bunch of work, um, this might be a more uh, effective way to kind of look at it, group it. So right now I'm grouped by item type, but I can group by resource, I can group by, there's something specific about your team or your product that you want to start focusing on to see how many of this particular item there is, or how far along in the process you are on a particular object or um, focus if, you've if you're using some form of tagging to kind of specify things. Um, you know, we have the capacity to do that within the object itself, and that's just when you go into an item, we're able to on the fly, we have a gear in the top right corner, add custom fields as you see fit. So I don't expect the general structure of the application to meet your needs. I'm fully expecting you guys to go in and customize it exactly the way you see fit. Um, and then the right side is just going to be kind of inline editing in different varying large text fields, comments, description. And then if you guys are tying in source control, um, you can also bring that into this as well, um, depending upon if you're working with uh, Git. Uh, GitHub TFS or Subversion of the three out of the box. If you're using anything else, uh, we do have a source control plugin um, framework that you can work with if you guys want to uh, to tie into your own repository. So it's definitely feasible. Um, from a planning perspective, I don't know that we necessarily need to get into the release planner. Um, this may be something you guys want to work on. I don't know. Um,
Let's go one more minute. Um, there we go. So um, if it is something that's helpful for you guys to kind of see who's working on what, this is where, if you click on the release planner, it allows you to see each of your different resources and what they've currently got assigned to them. And if you've gone in, again, it's totally up to you if you want to go about this, if you've gone in and said, I'm going to give each of my resources an estimated capacity. They work this many days, this many hours per week. Again, in your situation, since this isn't a full-time day, working with our product, maybe you just, you're doing two hours a day. But this way, it at least allows you to see what can I accomplish in the course of the time I have in the product line. What am I, you know, can I level set out, fully utilize myself or, or the team for that matter? So just kind of something to keep in mind if it does make sense and you guys see an advantage to working with that. All right, so the dashboard, again, if you want to visualize the data, um, this is just a simple dashboard where you can create a limited number of kind of more complex, visually appealing dashboards to see things. Um, so with that, it's just a, it was kind of a quick synopsis on the product line. I think the, the biggest advantage now is, you know, let's jump into Q&A and I want to see if I can address some of the questions, concerns that you guys have. If anybody wants to jump in, start peppering with them. Over here. Oh, yeah. um, for the burn down chart, in reference to the uh, um, tickets, features, and bugs, yeah. is there any difference for the burn down chart and how those are displayed? So, it can, so yeah, that's a good question. You do have the ability to um, see here. Actually, okay, this is where it would, when we choose the. I don't want to spend too much time digging into that, but if you were to use an all items function, you have the capacity to use the tool in a manner in which we actually would turn on a completely separate bug area, a completely separate feature. And this actually will segment the entire data structure behind the scenes where defects are totally separate from bugs versus right now what you see on my screen is I've just renamed features, work items, and I've created a pick list. The advantage of doing this is it allows me to see everything in one single Kanban view versus if I did an all items view, I wouldn't be able to have everything because these swim lanes are specific to the item type. So I'm able to customize the swim lanes for this. So in doing that, you do give up a little bit versus in, in, in the all item burn down, yes, I can actually segment it by item type in each of the burn down, the, each of these essentially um, will actually represent segmentation of the items themselves. I won't be able to do that in this particular scenario. So I will be able to see what items are in that sprint because again, I can just group by that item. And in each of them, I actually have a nice aggregate breakdown of how much work is being associated to that item type in that sprint. So again, it's filtered by the project, the sprint. I've already created two sub you know, soft filters right there. And then in addition to that, I've grouped by the item type. So now I've got a nice, again, summation of what's going on there. So um, kind of gets you what you're looking for, but it won't do it in the actual burn down itself. That would require us to move back to the old structure, which you can do, it's just a lot more comprehensive. It will require a lot more setup. We're trying to get away from have you guys having to commit a lot of time to set up. Yeah, you know, what's your reasoning behind that? I mean, um, yeah. when I first started using Axosoft eight weeks ago, um, all of my tickets that I made for my projects development all were in features. I didn't, yeah. use, I didn't use tickets, I just used features. Right. And I just wanted to make sure that they're for the, the display of the data in the burn down chart. It didn't matter whether it was tickets or features, and that it would still show up and you'd still get the velocity and the data would come off. Good question. So in, in that situation, it would still work. So if I had exposed, well, I'll just, which I have tickets exposed here, I do have the ability to, okay, just real quick. Uh, new ticket. So I have the ability to take that, and I can still throw that into, which I'm not exposing uh, release structure right now, but if I did, I could throw that into V2 release or spread to release, and then it would actually take all of that into account if I wanted to. So it could keep both items and pull them in. Because an example of this is teams that do segment it, their, their defect tracking, because with larger companies, um, they might have a dev staff that actually has a team managing bugs, and they've got that dev, and they've got their developers that are working on enhancements, and so they've got that team. So it will overlap some though. But in any case, each team's working on their workload, and then individually, or as a you know, scrum master or product manager, will actually pull their work into the sprint separately, and then give them one consolidated view of all of the effort, but that's typically managed by an individual that wants to say, I am consciously pulling this work into this sprint, because we can afford to have this much work in this sprint. So it's not just randomly pulling it in there. So in your case, you're better off just keeping it as one single item type, like features, and then what you can do, and again, I'm happy to show you guys how to do this, is creating a simple pick list that when I go to create a new item, 
I can just say, what is this item going to be? But it's really behind the scenes, just the features functionality. But again, one of the advantages of the front is I can customize this in any way I want. So if you want this, I'm happy to show you how to do that. It's a very simple uh, modification in here. Yeah. Can you go ahead and show us that? I can. <laughs> let's do that. So, uh, so in your product, so let's just assume if you've got your uh, system called features, let's start with just the barrier, the basic um, structure. If you want to rename it from the core, you go into tools, system labels. I'm able to go in and actually just relabel features to work items if I wanted to. So I can actually just come in here and relabel features and just go ahead and rename it work item, work items, work items. That's exactly how I wanted to set it up. I can turn on other things as well, or again, redact certain things as well. So if I want to have other tabs, I recommend probably leaving them off. I might turn off work block so you can see your time tracking. But leave the rest of the stuff off. It's just going to be more confusing than anything. First step is, again, renaming that. So tools, system labels. You're probably going to see the word features, and you'll just rename it to each of those different terminology. That's step one. But step two is let's create our pick list. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new custom field, under tools, field, custom fields. And we've already got a work item type field here called just create a secondary one. This is going to be a list field. And I have a work item in here, so but I'm going to create again a second one. So I'm going to go ahead and manage my lists. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to jump directly into managing lists and create Let's call this, let's call this work item two. And then I simply create. Again, this is where you can decide what you want them to be called. Bug. Just leave it at that. So we'll just say those are going to be the ones we want to use. Close that out. And now I should have my work item two. Work item two, save. And now I've got this new list item type created, which is available for me to use. Not done yet, though. I created it, but I've not applied it to anything yet. It's not actually a part of any field template. So what happens then is you have default templates that are already created for you guys. You're already using them right now. If you go into Tools, Fields, Fields, <coughs> Templates, you've probably just got one that's currently turned on right now, which is just your starter field template. If I edit this guy, it's already in here for you, most likely. But it would have been if this was a brand new setup. If you're on an existing system and it didn't make it in there, then I could pull this out. Put that off. Actually, it's required, so it's going to leave there. So I'll just leave it there for now. Let's bring the other one. So now I'm going to find my work item two. And then I've already got my pick list filled in. So now I just drag it over, save it, close. And now if I go to create a new item, here's my new work item two. And it's now got your pick list there. So you're good to go in that regard. So and if you guys um, no, I'm going too fast on that, let me know where I'm recording this. So you guys will be able to go back and kind of re-reference this if you want to. Other questions? Yes. Is there any sort of archive for deleted um, features to get things like that? So like if, if you go through and like delete a feature, is there any sort of archive you can find that in? So I would suggest, if unless it was like a, an absolute error uh, that you deleted it, I would probably say do archive, do not delete. So unless it was just clearly like this thing was a duplicate and we don't need it, I would go through an archiving process, which I would potentially even not even do this where I right-click archive. I would even create a workflow step. Let me go ahead and rename it to dev because that was for a pre previous presentation. We've got completed, and then maybe we just do archive. And then what we can do here is this. And then there's one setting here where if an item lands in this, archive the item. Sole purpose of this workflow step is for me to just drop work once it reaches that step into it, and it just disappears. Now, if in that remote chance you did delete it, there is no trash bin. So you did, be careful. Now, if it's something that there was a catastrophic where you did a bulk deletion, in, this is part of the reason why when we do a setup with a client, we turn off deletion capability for everybody except for that. <coughs> But um, in this situation, if you did, we do have nightly backups. We actually do iterative backups over the course of the day, every hour. So we would be able to re recover the data. Um, but I don't know if this is necessarily that we want that. In this case, but yeah, if you did accidentally delete your entire project, don't worry. Everything's in the cloud. I can get you that. I can get you back to it probably an hour ago uh, as a version of what you were working on. Um, Questions on 
burn down, setting it up, getting it working? Anybody? Is everybody's burn down working fine? Yeah. yeah, let's just go through. Well, let's go through the structure of how to get a burn down to work in the first place. And then this might help you guys because it's not a perfect science, but it needs just a couple basic functions for it to work. So the first thing we're going to have is we need a project. To start out with everything starts. That's the foundation for everything we're going to do. So we create a project. We a dev and innovation. Just to get the conversation I was having a little earlier today. The second step is and let's just create a new innovation. I'm going to create a corresponding release as you see here. So now, when I create my first item, which actually I'm going to pretend that we're not a release yet, we're not pulling it, so it's going to be a new user story. And now we've got a new user story. Now it's not a part of any particular release. Actually, it is, but it shouldn't have been. So what we're also really going to do is once you have a work in the system, you're going, to build out, you're going to build out your first UAT product backlog, and then you're going to say, all right, what is our first V1.0 of this product? And you give it a time frame. So you guys can skip going V1 if that's not necessary. You just want to get right to your first sprint. But typically what I would recommend is you, you build out your first version, which is going to be a much larger span of time. You know, the first version may take us a month or two. So say it's going to take us out some people. Then, what are we working on right now? So this is our UAT sprint one. And this is something that we're focused on, we'll say, the fourth. We're hoping to wrap this up on, say, the 25th. So you get to do it a little bit longer than two weeks' work. So this is the first step. Project, build out your release hierarchy. It needs those dates. And you can go in and show that data, show due date on tree. This is helpful. This helps me understand when I'm hoping to ship sprint one. Now, go back to UAT, releases, create a second user story. Now, each of these items, each of these user stories needs time associated to them. So I'm going to fast forward this, and I'm just going to add the time for all of them at once. But essentially, when you go in and you create a ticket, create a defect, create a bug, you hopefully have a reasonable idea of how long this item is going to take to complete. So when I'm doing that, I'm going to create an initial estimate. I'm going to see for each of these. Taking two and a half hours to complete. Now, if I did this right, I should have also filled in my remaining estimate. Let me double check. It did. So, as well, actually, no, it didn't. Okay, so let me go ahead and fill that in as well. When you add it in the first time, individually on the ticket, it'll fill in both of those. So, if you're doing it as a multi edit, Clearly, we'll not add that in, so just be aware of that. So, no, two point five here. When you when you do your first estimate, these two values are going to be identical because if I'm if I'm in, assuming it's going to take me two and a half hours to create this, then I therefore have two and a half hours remaining to complete this object. And so, so what this system cares about is that remaining estimate value. That's what creates the velocity, the burn down. And so, it essentially takes that data alive. So, I'm going to take this. Drag this down, drag this down. So I basically, again, project, created the release hierarchy, estimated against the work, and then I pull that work into the sprint. These are all the steps to kick off our first work release, which we should have our first call. This is on March 4th. We've added in all of the work, which essentially I'm kicking off my sprint. Now what happens is, is tomorrow, Again, it would probably be more than one or two objects. This would maybe be 15, 20, 100. You ultimately know how much work goes into your first sprint. I then, tomorrow, later on today, I did work on this. Let's say I knocked out an hour on this. I can add in work log. Now, what I did there is I actually hit W on my keyboard. A lot of you guys, have obviously, you guys are all technically inclined. Used to short keyboard shortcuts. So again, shift question mark will bring up the keyboard shortcuts. Get used to these. It's going to speed up your ability to use the product line a lot faster. So things like creating a new item, C, adding a work log in, W, editing an item, E, helps you fly through the tool much faster than having to actually lift your hand up onto the mouse. So again, I added time into the system. Well, I just I just committed an hour to this as well. This, 
tomorrow is now going to start to have a descending value because I've eaten away an hour of this, which you can see here in sprint two, 200 hours, the next day, team knocked out 19 hours, and so on and so forth. And this is essentially, in order for your sprint to work, it needs the, these basic pieces of information. Project, release, broken down into its either version and sprint or just go straight to sprint. The work itself that you're going to have in the sprint, and then estimating against the items themselves. So when you create an item, right at the point of creation, just give it some vague estimate. It doesn't have to be exact, but just what you think it's going to take to accomplish that. And then over the course of that day, the next day, um, make sure you're committing time to that item. You can go into the item. You could theoretically just go in and manually edit it. If you really wanted to, that would work as well. The nice thing about doing the work log entry, which is hitting W, is it will also take all of your time entry, and then you can report off of that if you wanted to. You can now, as a team, see who's done what, who's committed what time across the sprint, across each of the resources. It may or may not be valuable to you, but it's just uh, it's, it's very helpful for you to have that information. And I can tell you, getting into the real world, once you guys get out there and you guys start getting into a world in which you are held accountable, that time becomes very important because this is what they're going to track your compensation against. This is where they're going to track your um, sense of usefulness within the company. So these values become very important, specifically, specifically when the game comes. So, so keep in mind, we've got uh, a handful of big groups that we work with. Um, questions? Just want to. I mean, I just want to say. So I'm having you guys show me the burn down charts of your teams. Uh, each individually, you're all showing me every week your, your team burn down chart. And I want it for the sprint, right? Because that makes the most sense to the current sprint that we're working on. And the reason I ask everybody to do that is so I know that you're all on the same page, or hopefully you're all on the same page. You understand because you're all part of, of a, a larger team. So that's the reasoning behind this um, and asking for the estimated completion date. So that's something that will pop up on the burn down chart. Just... Yeah, it'll do a quick. Yeah, so basically, it's not going to give me, we don't have data right now because we literally just started this spread. It's going to need a day for to extrapolate. But it will very quickly, within a day, based upon if, if from today to tomorrow we get any work, then it'll, it, it'll be able to do it. If we don't do anything over that first <coughs> day, it's also like we're not going to have an estimated completion date because we have not done anything. It's just a flat line. So it needs that ability to kind of recognize the delta where we're, all right, we're starting to do something. And then it will extrapolate from that. Your due date is the, third, is the 14th. Your completion date is estimated to be the 21st. So we'll quickly know you guys need to kick it up a notch or you're doing exceptionally. Yeah, and so that's the second part, which I'm asking you to put into the post uh, the actual estimated completion date that's showing up and then give me an explanation of what you think is happening. Are we on time? Why? Are we, off? Are we not on time? Are we behind? Why? What can we do about that? Uh, again, I want you to think as a team, be self-organized and be able to kind of collaborate and work and how do we make this better rather than just being folks who get tasks to do, right? Exactly. So yeah, so it's it's very easy to come in and see all the workload. If you want to come in and just simply filter on my work, you can just come in and go to assign to me and look at your workload. Otherwise, we can just do a group by user, and then I can see who's working with what, which is some that aren't. And then we've got the team broken down into what you are working on. And it will, if you've given me those estimate values, it's going to give me then what you are kind of a quick summation, a quick aggregate of, all right, you've got four items, 20 hours work, 36 hours remaining, you're about 35% of your way there based upon spread to project A and so on and so forth. So you can quickly see how you are individually doing or as a group how the team is doing as well. Can you, just, can you go through the release planner? Just to show you got it. What's going on. So we added some new functionality to the release planner as well, which I don't think is going to be applicable for you guys just yet. That's something to think about. So you guys are all working on one product right now. So, um, so the, a, a client of ours, CD Project Red, which creates the Witcher game, um, is working on a dozen, two dozen, probably more than that product at any given time. And so this function is extremely helpful for them. So when you go to plan out a sprint, part of that process is understanding who's working on what. So if we're going to start looking at, say, sprint one, we don't have anything assigned here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out who is going to be a part of this sprint. This would typically have much, a much greater uh, workload here of unassigned work. Then first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull in those team members. So we'll say Floyd. And then we might go ahead and pull in Mike. 
say these are our two resources working on this. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to see right off the bat what is their availability. And it's what, what it's looking at here is this window of time. Oh, from 3.4 to 3.25, I know that Floyd, again, we needed some a little initial configuration on your part. What days does Floyd work? How many hours does Floyd work a day? In this case, it's probably hard more than six, but we always factor in a cushion for meetings, lunches, etc. So we're saying six hours a day. You can plug in vacation. We have a global vacation function as well. But ultimately, we've got a gauge of your availability in this window of time. And this is where this percentage allocated comes into play. This wasn't, we just recently added this in. If you're a part of multiple products, which is, again, very, very feasible. If you're a really high-end UI, UX guy or whatever, you may be doing that for three games or whatever the case is. And so if that's the case, then we need to identify how much, from a percentage perspective, are you working on game one? versus game two versus game three. It will then take from that over that window of time and tell them you've got 15 hours available this week because you're on two other sprints going on right now and we, that's all we can give you. So for you guys, it's less of a concern because you're just probably working on the one product that you have. So in your case, it's really pretty straightforward. You just drag down the work to the resource and it starts to fill in your capacity. So this is nice where even from just a simplistic perspective where You've got a team of three, a team of five, whatever the case, you've got 15 or 20 items. You can basically, again, pick the sprint, which in your case is probably just the one project, one sprint you've got. Pick the corresponding sprint here. So this is going to be where you plan. This is going to be the workload to be planned. And then pull in the resources you get that are part of it, which is essentially going to be you and your team. And then from here, it's dragging over. So if, if work wasn't assigned yet, I could also just pull it over. To this release, which has already been part of this, and then drag it down to the resource. So it's pretty straightforward. You don't have to create estimate value, you don't have to do anything here. All that should have been done ahead of time. The whole purpose of this, from at least from what you guys need, is just quickly seeing who's working on what and on am I fully utilized based upon the available time I've given myself in the tool. You guys aren't working 40 hours a week in this in the system. So take that into account. If you're working two hours a week in actual soft right now, load that. So that it can at least tell you, based on those two hours of availability, what you can handle based upon the workload you guys have created in the system. So it's a nice handy way to see if you're you know, fully utilized. One question. Yeah. Um, so say since you just assigned Floyd an uh, assignment just there, what's the best like notification that he's going to get? Or does he just have to go back to the release planner and check to see if he has any other work? He'll get a notification. So yeah, so automatically the system is set up to that notification. So off the bat, anything that is work item created, changed, or deleted. So right off the bat, Floyd just got an email that, hey, an item went from no assignment to you, item ID is um, 46, and then it'll have some specifics about the user story or the defect or whatever it is, and it'll have a URL directly in the email that you just click and it drives you right to the ticket itself. Okay, so you don't have to do anything. Now, you can ultimately come back to the release planner if you want to see kind of a, a holistic view of everything, but you'll always be aware of that. You can both do notification via email and we do SMS as well if you're really eager to be aware of what's going on. You can obviously trigger to your phone as well. Good. That's not hoping to be helpful for you guys as well. So I think, I mean, this will be, this is helpful for everybody again. And the reason I asked for the for uh, a screenshot of the release planner is to, just to see that you're all understanding how much time you're putting into it um, and if you're being utilized fully, right? So if all of your 10 hours per week um, are being met. And then also, as far as the leads and anybody who's organizing across team, if the 10 hours per week are being met for on-ground, 30 hours for online, and so on. So you can start to see, uh, you can start to see that a little bit more. I know it's per sprint, um, but that's fine. And I know that also sometimes folks are on different teams, uh, where Justin is, but uh, on different, if you're working on two different teams, right, you can see the percentage that you're working on there, and you can say to somebody, no, I know, you know, you might need a programmer right now, but I'm already being used, used pretty pretty heavily on this project or not, right? So um, that's the whole concept of a team of teams or scrum of scrums if we eventually get to that point where we've got people with designers or artists or programmers who can go on multiple teams. This will help a lot with that too. So um, as, as a team, again, it's good to know who's being utilized and who's not being utilized. And then I'm sure, I don't know if there's a way to label it or not, but I mean, you probably already know just by the name of what, what kind of position they are. I don't know if there's a way to label like yeah, but what kind of skill sets or something on there? Like, um, so like animation, you know. Oh, okay. So in that case, or whatever. It's 
people want to do something like that. If we wanted to do that, you could do it based upon team. So we could have dev, programmer team, you know, okay. that, but, but if you're individually looking at it, so I can do it on a team perspective. If you're doing it on an individual perspective, then you might actually want to even go with like the load, like the image and then create an image that represents what uh, role type they are. Because uh, I'll know what the user is, but there's no way for me to say that Michael is a programmer. I know Michael's a programmer if I were to go to tools security roles, but it doesn't translate here. I could create it. Now, if you wanted to, you could do this if you really want to. You could, when you create an item, and then if that item becomes mine, I could create a role custom field, and then that would be an exposed data point that I could then use, and that shows up anyway. So if we go back over to the release planner, I can add in that common field. So if we had role type, then it would show up here, and then I would see programmer next to Floyd. I would see QA against Michael, so, so it is definitely feasible, but it's not it's not tied to Michael. It was it was associated at the point of creation of the table. So if this item goes from Michael to Floyd, we need to make sure we also change the role type as well. So there, it does get a little murky in that regard. Um, so, let's see my, yes. So I was wondering about notifications as well. Is there a way to make it so that instead of it constantly bombarding everyone on the team with notifications, it just like the scrum master, the product owner, and the person who is assigned to or team is assigned to gets notifications when tickets are changed because. Joe on the team who works on ARP doesn't need to be notified with 30 programming tickets that were assigned to Bob are done. Correct. Yes, so you absolutely would set it up that way. So the notifications out of the box are, are already smart notifications. So it's already going to know when it's changed. It's going to do it to the assigned to user. So it's going to be a token value. So it's only going to care about if an item was changed, it's going to notify the person who the item was assigned to. George was never a part of this item. He's going to be oblivious to any changes that occurred on that object. And it's only if an item was modified. In this case, I've got the assigned to and the request to report it by. And then that could also throw in who the scrub master might be in this. In that case, it could be built hypothetically into the scrub master. So I could have these three values. These two are tokens, so these are dynamically changing. So at any point, maybe it started out being assigned to you, but then it moved to QA. So at that point, it's now assigned to the QA team. So you're no longer going to get notifications on this item anymore unless you want to be a part of that. In that case, I just need to write into this thing that you stay a part of the notification process. So it's just kind of how, so this is, again, default value, or we go in and let's create a brand new notification, and then we do it based upon very specific things, which, you know, if, if an item moves from one particular workflow step to another, then I want to be notified. But you're right. You don't want just a, a, a mass loss of emails because then they become useless. Because you, you, you become tone deaf, or you just actually get to start. Ignoring. So the default is false to be a false one. Yeah, and it's already it's already set up to be a smart notification so that only the individual who's currently assigned to it would be notified of any changes on that. And then it's also set to whoever requested the ticket would be notified. So if you if you requested it, but it's actually assigned to Ben, then but you two are both kept up in speed. And we can remove that if you don't want the request invited to be informed. The only person that should care about this is the person who owns it right now, or the team that owns it. You can create. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question. Is there any way to like when you're when you're creating that feature uh, template? Yeah. Is there any way to have it initialized like default uh, values? Like say for like uh, time as well. if, I, if I have a field on there that's that's like our like it's a, a branch field it's for our program we design. Is there any way for me to set up so when I default it to ARP, it will give it a default estimate of like two hours? Is there any way to set that up? Yes. You would do it actually at the workflow level. So instead, what you would do is you would say, I've got a new item, but I'm going to move it into ARP. So let's say ARP. I can actually come in here and I can set my initial estimate to be any time I move it into ARP, be two hours. And then let me also do the remaining <coughs> because I need both of those to be identical. Two hours. Just create this work and stuff. Drag it up here. <coughs> and so now, if I move this item over, so it's got zero values here. Two hours. So it's automatically just given this the remaining estimate value of two hours. And the initial estimate was also set to two hours. So you can create the structure off the bat so you know. Consistently, it's always going to be this time for this effort, which is a lot of teams do this. You you can kind of start to create this this repetitive process. 
of it should always take this roughly amount of time. On the fly, if we need to adjust it, so be it. But let's at least get a default value in there. I don't want to have to go in and freak in every time. So yeah, you could have an art workflow step, which maybe you know everything starts in new, but maybe then it goes into art, then it goes into new progress. So you're almost kind of re so it could be set the estimate value, set the team, set any default custom value that you're going to come up with. Do all of that on this one workflow step. So you don't have to go ahead and repeat this process over again. If you know every time I create an art object, it needs these 15 things. So it'll save you a lot of time and effort. And you do that at the workflow step level. Just keep in mind, if I move it into in progress, make a bunch of changes, and I move it back, it's going to take over all those values that were in art, wipe out what was previously in progress, and move it back to the art. So you just got to be careful, because the art is always waiting for anything to land in here to change it to those 15 things, always. So you always want to be progressing forward unless you're in a situation where you've got like a, a rejected. In that case, I can set the system up so that if I reject something, it can only go back to in progress. It can never go back to this far forward. So you can actually control that way if you want. Um, and I was going to mention the notifications as well. It may be overkill, but um, you can set up notification, a monitoring notification, so that just for your own sake, if an item comes into the system and it's been sitting in a certain state for too long, notify me. Because this is probably going to be concerning because it's taking too long. This thing should have been moved to this step, should be in this status, it should be past this percentage complete. So you can create um, your own little like service level uh, monitor. I'm just doing screenshots. I mean, I don't know what you, I think when we talked about it last time, we can't really report the burn down so well. Uh, no, screenshots are the best. Yeah, we don't really do a print off of the burn down. We do print offs of everything you see on your screen. It'll just take a basically you know, what we see on the screen, generate it, we PDF that, but the burn down would not be one of those things. So, yeah, so we just do a quick screenshot of that and capture it. Well, since so we're back on burndown, I'm actually having a problem. With my burndown in my dashboard shows everything at works like that. So when I do the workflow step thing, it just says not updated. Can you go into the workflow? Step? Well, I mean, no, right there, right where you are right now. Yeah. And it displayed. It just says not updated. Not not updated. Right here. Well, you're seeing this. It is showing a valid burndown, but you're. It's showing the burndown chart, and then a point where the where the burn down started and saying God oh, no, Gotcha. Okay, so it's probably looking more like this. No, actually no. It was it was what I had here before, but I think it was since I created. Yeah, something like that with a red dot. Yeah. Okay. Um but in the dashboard it shows right. Dashboard it shows right. Okay. Well the so this and what you see in the dashboard may not be the same burn downs. This burn down is specific to what you have selected. The dashboard you will actually come in and tell the system I want this value. So it's a little different. The, 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 the in line burn down is specific to what you clicked. The dashboard is waiting for you to tell it what you want it to be. So I would maybe check and make sure that those are the same data points that you're looking at, data sets you're looking at. Um, as for this, if you're getting a not enough data, a couple things can cause that. You have pulled a bunch of work into it, and then you, you may be working on it, but you're not doing it what the system considers to be work on it. And so what that, what that means essentially is, you know, if I'm looking at this sprint, am I committing time to this item? So I've got work in here, but if I don't do anything and just leave it, you know, I start dragging these over, that's not going to do anything to this. So if I move this into approve, that's great. But then I also need to say, what did I do to get it to approve? I must have put in 25 hours. I have to, to commit time to the system, and that's what begins to erode this. So again, tomorrow when we come in, this is started out as X value, it's going to be Y value the next day because it recognizes the delta. And that's what it'll take it from a, a, a plateau to a cliff. To a cliff. Otherwise, what else would cause that? Or if you start it out right, and then you throw a bunch of work in mid sprint, it went from this to this. And now all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't know if this is ever going to complete because I can give you a date here. And maybe give you a, I can't give you a date here, I can't give you a date here. So if you mid sprint add work into it and it exceeds what the velocity was before, 
then the system's going to go out of whack because it can't extrapolate from your effort when you're ever going to complete. So just something to keep in mind as well. So be careful when you, you throw stuff in mid spurt. <laughs> So Jesse, questions? Kenny? Desiree, you guys good moving it all over from Assembler? Yeah, we already have all of them moved over and we have everyone, well, mostly everyone posting their hours there. The people that aren't posting their hours weren't posting their hours to Assembly either, so that's a whole separate issue. Yeah. <laughs> they just aren't doing it at all. So actually, I think that's a question. Yeah. So what's the uh, benefits of having like sub items? Good question. So let's look at it this way. So, if an item, if, you're, if it's possible to just simply take this user story and, and be done with it, no need to break it down. But look at it this way. So if someone's going to build out a new mobile app or a mobile game or whatever the case is, and part of that represents a very large user story, that probably has a bunch of additional components that you need to complete to finish that user story. It would be really nice to be able to actually track those individual components. So if I go in and I do a new NS, add sub item, now I can say this could be a small function to be built for this. Or what would really be, uh, let me go to like my dev project, sprint two, and then when we look at this, I've got like server build. Spec and order server, config server, big example for that. Server build in and of itself represents a lot of effort necessary. So in doing so, let's break it down, assign that work. So look at it from a game perspective, you might have a UI guy, you might have a, a graphics, whatever. Each person has a three-hour component that, that's necessary or whatever hour component is necessary to complete this user story. I want to start tracking their effort. I can only be big brother, but if I can task this out, I don't have to worry about all the intricate parts of this. I have the team done, but once the team's done, all they need to do is move in progress and approved to close. I can set up workflow, switch back over to Kanban, I can set up workflow so that when I move all of my work in all of these sub items into completed, it will drag the parent user story to completed. So actually we can create the parent user story as essentially just the starting point. Break it down into all of its functional work, assign that work out to the team. All that work's still going into the sprint because each of those have estimates. The estimate values, by the way, roll up to the parent. So if I've got two estimate values for these two, it rolls into the parent <coughs> user story. So I still see the parent level how much effort is necessary to accomplish it but it's representative of all of the subtasks that were created for it. So again, if you think about it, if it's something that you're just gonna knock out yourself, you probably just need a user story. But if it's something that's gonna be bigger, and you and maybe four other people are gonna work on it, rather than just moving server build to the next person to the next person, break it down, identify what the individual work that those folks are gonna work on, and then give it an estimate, even if it's just an hour, it's two hours, whatever the case. And then as they complete their work, at varying workflow steps, so that everybody can be everywhere on this list, on this swim lane. But once they all hit complete, parent user story throws to complete. And then back to the notification, it will notify the owner of the user story, which may be that project. So this is a lot of the ways our existing customers do it. The, the product manager will create the user stories, break them down. The team will then come in and self-select what they're going to work on. If I drag this over, it automatically assigned it to Michael Parrish. So I let the team come in and just take work. I got this, this is what I do. And then when I complete this, this represents one of 16 pieces of this epic user story. When it's all done, it throws forward to complete, or maybe it moves forward to something like a approved, or you're waiting for final approval. And then the manager, product manager, scrum master, whoever will look at it and say, it looks good, move to ship, or whatever the case is. So that's one of the reasons why you would sub item it out. Uh, so, because we use sub items, and they kind of throws off like our kind of but is there a way to, if the sub-items are all complete, to automatically make the parent complete at the same time, or do yeah. have to do that same thing? No, no. So, yeah, so, when you go to, so if you go into workflow and say, and this is exactly what this step is for, automatically move parent items into this workflow step if all of the children move to this workflow step. So all you have to do is set that. So now, let's just, let's test this theory out. We'll grab it couple sub items that are not enclosed and let's close them out, but I'm not going to touch the parent. We'll do it in grid view so you can kind of see it happening live. So we'll just take to the spec order, go ahead and move it to complete. Take approve, move it to complete, and watch the parent complete. Uh, 
That's all you gotta do. So never really have to worry about it. Create the original user story, you know, whatever the object is, could be bug user or whatever the case is, and then break it down. And then you really don't have to even touch. You can literally leave the apparent user story in like in progress the whole time. And then once they're all done, move. It'll just take care of itself. And you can even set it up so that if an item, so hypothetically, see you forgot to fill in the remaining time on an item, you can set it up so that if you're like, all right, well, if it's completed, go ahead and actually set the remaining estimate values automatically to zero, which it will show here. It'll just wipe out. So say you had five hours in there. The disadvantage here is you may not have worked five hours that day on that item. So what happens there is we've seen it where you get this kind of plateau and then cliff, which isn't really realistic of what you did. It doesn't represent what the true effort was. You may have chipped away at it. So this is where committing time consistently throughout. That would be at the moment, but at the end of each day, try to go back and just plug in your time as you did it that day, or do it at that moment. But we're working on a method in which you don't actually ever have to commit time to the system. When you go in and edit the item, it will actually just start tracking right off the bat. And it will actually prompt you to say, do you want to or not track at this point? So we're working on making it easier so that you don't even have to actually think about it. The system will just start to track and then commit the time in the system for you. But we're a little ways away around. Does that answer? Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Can you hang around just for a little bit? Yeah. People still want yeah. to make sure you do their yeah. use of one-off stuff as well. Cool. Well, thanks. Uh, Larry, round of applause, please. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Just remember, um, our sprint is coming to a close relatively soon. And then